Well, welcome tonight. My name is Parvang Patel. I'm the Executive Director for the Harvard College Observatory. I would like to thank you for joining us this evening uh, for the first collaboration of its kind, and hopefully many more to come, uh, between the Harvard Bookstore, Harvard University Division of Science, Harvard Library, and the Center for Astrophysics, CFA. You might not expect uh, the first talk, this first talk, hosted by the CFA to be about poetry, uh, but our guests this evening specialize in the intersection of art and science. Their recent book, The Warp Side of Our Universe, An Odyssey Through Black Holes, Wormholes, Time Travel, and Gravitational Waves, artistically renders vast theoretical concepts tangibly in paintings and verse. Our authors tonight are renowned artist and professor Leah Halloran from Chapman University and Kip Thorne, Nobel Laureate and Richard Feynman Professor Emeritus of Theoretical Physics at California Institute of Technology. Our moderator, moderator this evening, uh, Professor Alan Lightman, the first person at MIT to receive dual appointments in science and the humanities, will be joining us as well. These individuals bridge the gap between art and science, both Alan and Kip, have published poetry, and Leah has immersed herself in scientific investigations through artistic practices. Alan's 2009 book, Song of Two Worlds, balances philosophy and science through haunting verse. I'd like to share an excerpt from that book now. As I hold this glass shard in my hand, I have entered the cosmos of questions with answers. This is a world of the sharp spheres of hail, orbits of planets, vibrations of atoms, the fission of cells, pulse of a neuron, the plucked string of a harp, and wavelength of blue light. We are grateful that Kip and Leah are joining us again this evening as neither of them are strangers to the CFA. While Kip has spent time at the CFA doing the work as we all expect, Leah most recently collaborated with the Wolbach Library and the Harvard Plate Stacks for the creation of the 2016 art exhibit, Your Body is a Space That Sees. This series of cyanotype prints actively links science and history and highlights the Harvard College Observatory's legacy of pioneering women astronomers, some of whom also wrote poetry about their work at the observatory. Before I hand it over to Alan, I'd like to share one such poetry, or poem, by an anonymous author found among the glass plate photographs. It plays with familiar motifs seen in the Song of Two Worlds and the warp side of our universe. Title, The Plates. Keyholes of light along corridors of time, open secrets yet unveiled, to searching eye rest on cool glass, Instance frozen in eternity. Please join me in welcoming Leah Halloran, Kip Thorne, and Alan Lightman. I'll just start with Paul Yaman. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Leah Halloran. I'm Kip Thorne. We're thrilled to be here today. Uh, we're looking forward to our conversation with Alan. He's a superb physicist, as I know well. He was my student uh, <laughs> more decades ago than I would like to remember. He's a great writer, a poet, playwright, and social entrepreneur and professor of the practice of humanities at MIT, and a very dear friend of ours. And thank you, Alan, for joining us. But before we begin our conversation with Alan, we would like to read to you an excerpt from our book and show you some of its paintings. We'll start with the book's prologue, which explains what the book is all about. Our universe is varied and vast. Galaxies, planets, stars, and moons, quasars, pulsars, and magnetars all made from atoms and molecules, just like you and me, and all that we hear and touch and see. 
Our universe is also endowed with a marvelous shadowy side that is warped, phenomena forged from warped space-time. Witness the ravenous fat black hole that Leah here depicts ingesting her wife, Felicia. Although this warp side is entwined in the weft of our matter-filled universe, its stars, its planets and nebula, its galaxies and its comets, we humans never saw it until just recently. Why did we never see? Warp space-time cannot produce light or other signals that yesterday's technology was able to perceive. So now, how has that changed? A very long time ago, a billion years in the past, while here on Earth, multicelled life arose and spread around the globe, but in a galaxy far, far away, two spinning black holes danced around one another, rippling the fabric of space and time. The ripples, we call them gravity waves, sucked energy from the hole's orbit. So the holes spiraled inward, eclipsing each other toward a climactic collision. The holes at half of light speed catastrophically collided and merged in a brief cataclysmic storm of writhing and twisting space-time that brought the waves to crescendo. The climaxing gravity waves from this catastrophic collision surged out of their birthing galaxy and into interstellar space. Spreading across our universe for nearly a billion years, they stretched and they squeezed all that they met, stars and planets and nebula, in patterns that encoded a portrait of their birth, colliding holes and space-time storm. Then 50,000 years ago, when humans shared the Earth with Neanderthals, the spreading and weakening gravity waves sailed into our spiral-armed Milky Way, our galaxy, our home. On September 14th of 2015, near the Antarctic Peninsular tip, the waves flying upward plunge into the Earth through air and then oceans, then rock. Whispering up through Earth's bowels unscathed and emerging just north of New Orleans, the gravity waves came face to face with a complex and huge L-shaped invention designed and built to perceive them, LIGO the Laser Interferometer Gravity Wave Observatory. Flowing through LIGO, the gravity waves stretched and then squeezed microscopically two very long beams of bouncing light that extracted the portraits the waves had encoded, colliding holes and space-time storm. This tiny shutter in LIGO was momentous for the whole human race, our very first moment of contact with the warp side of our universe. The warp side of our universe is home to many beasts, beasts that are forged from warp space and time, beasts that may well include black holes and wormholes, time machines and cosmic strings, gravity waves and singularities, our universe's big bang birth and many other beasts, wondrous, weird and wild. For decades I, a beast, materially composed, have been consumed by quest to fully comprehend this warped side of our universe. How? Through tricks of mathematics and computer simulations, probing Albert Einstein's relativity equations. And in a thousand person fleet of scientists and engineers, we've pursued a quest to invent, construct, and utilize our behemoth LIGO for humans' first encounters with the warped side of our universe. Big questions have driven these warp side quests, some that I'm sure you have asked yourself and some you likely have not. How did our universe begin? Can anything travel backward in time? Can advanced civilizations build wormholes for fast interstellar travel? How does warp space-time behave when wildly, frenziedly writhing like the open sea in a storm? How does the warp side of our universe impact the material side the side that we humans see and feel. In this artistic poetic book that undulates in your hands, Leah and I use paintings and verse to shed some glimmers of light on all of these big questions. What is Felicia? She's the sum of all her parts, her face, her silken hair, her arms and breasts, her hands and legs and feet, her heart, her brain, her precious personality. 
And what is a black hole? It's the sum of all its parts. It's space that is warped, the funnel of bulk being seas, its vortices of whirling space, its tendencies that stretch and squeeze, its slowing time and down cascading time, its horizon and its singularities, all made from warped space time. All right. Okay. Alan, would you join us? Well, I wanted to start by just looking at the physical object there. Um, if anybody has, has picked it up, it's, it's a weighty book. Um, I weighed it a couple of days ago. It weighs about four pounds. And I think that, that Kip Thorne is probably incapable of writing a lightweight book. Uh, his, his massive tomb, tome on gravity called MPW weighs about... Um, five and a half pounds. <laughs> you made that, weighed that too, didn't you? I weighed that too. <laughs> and his book uh, with Roger Blanford, uh, Classical Modern Physics, tips the scales at eight pounds. <laughs> so, so what I- I heard that it's been used as doorstops. It, what I uh, infer from, from these, is, these books is that, that physics uh, is a heavy subject, <laughs> but Kip and Leah have managed to lighten it considerably with Leah's beautiful and whimsical paintings and Kip's poetic prose. So uh, the first question I want to ask you, and you can talk, answer, uh, and I have questions for both of you, but you can talk as long as you want, is um, uh, for those of, 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 of you who don't know, uh, can the two of you recount how you first met and how this project started? I'll let Leah begin. <laughs> well, the, the way that we met was through a book where I met Kip probably seven years before Kip met me. Was my mother gifted me Kip's book, uh, which is called Black Holes and Time Warps, Einstein's Outrageous Legacy. And I, as an undergrad, uh, majored in art at UCLA, and uh, I had a moment where I thought I might double major in astrophysics and I was taking a lot of astronomy classes. So I already was really interested in science and physics. I never wanted to be an astronomer, just loved the way that these big ideas made me excited about um, understanding the natural world. And when I went on to grad school for painting at Yale, I um, was gifted Kip's book. And uh, it was the first time that I thought maybe this is an entry point for subject matter that I could actually start making art about something, some intersection of science. And so I think it was one of my uh, pieces in my MFA show was really strongly based on the way that Kip described the experience of moving close to the speed of light. So that's sort of, that's really it in a nutshell. I read this book, I was like, this is so cool. It makes me understand these ideas a little bit more uh, experientially. And then fast forward about seven years later, I'm at a cocktail party for a mutual friend of ours. Who's a, Lisa who's a, Randall, whom yeah. many of you will know. She's a Har physicist here. Here at Harvard. And um, she and I was, were at the party and I heard someone over, um, I overheard someone say something, something Kip Thorne and my ears perked up and I was like, where is Kip Thorne? And so I ran up and eagerly introduced myself and uh, I think I pretty much begged you to come over for a studio visit. Well, I came over very eagerly. I was <laughs> curious about what, what this very young woman <laughs> was doing uh, with art that she told me was associated with science. And in fact, I, uh, it was at the beginning of a, the collaboration that would give rise to the movie Interstellar, and I, I wanted a drawing that would depict black holes and wormholes in a way that I could show to Steven Spielberg, who was the first uh, director of uh, Interstellar uh, in the creative phase that was, uh, Christopher Nolan took it over in the end and uh, made it what it is. But uh, so I asked her if she would uh, draw for me a, a sketch of uh, black holes and wormholes. 
and she did right there on the spot. And it's one of my most treasured uh, possessions that hangs uh, in my office at home. And we have copies of it, uh, a, a, a little piece of it in, in the back matter, a, a little uh, print of it in the back matter of this book. And it also appears in uh, The Science of Interstellar. So uh, it was just uh, wonderful having met her and using this as an entree to Steven Spielberg. But I will say, you didn't say that it was for Steven Spielberg. He said there was a young filmmaker who was interested. Yeah. And I said, listen, I've never heard of this guy. I hope he's doing OK. But so you be careful where you, you know, and I literally made this sketch and ripped it out of the, my moleskin. And now I would go back in time. I wish I had used like a really nice piece of paper. But So that's how we met. <laughs> well, will you, you talk about this in the preface of your book, um, but can you talk a little bit now about what it's been like to work together over the many years that you've been working on this book. It has been just enormously fun, uh, really engaging. Uh, I think we began with, a, uh, with a, what had been planned to be a magazine article, but we decided we would turn it into a book. And we had about, what, five paintings and about three or 4,000 words. Mm -hmm. And uh, we... Uh, a friend of Leah's. Well, you tell the story of getting the first layout. Um, well, the we were through Kip's past editor for the book that I had mentioned previously, Amy Lloyd. She had gone to Playboy magazine and had become a literary editor there. And Kip had been invited to do an article. And I wasn't going to talk about Playboy oh, here. This we is, can't this talk. We can't tell this at story Harvard. Can you talk about Playboy at Harvard? <laughs> you guys want to hear about Playboy? Um, and so, um, well, at least it's the woman who's introducing. This yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and actually, we we did call this book our little book. By the way, for about ten years, our um, publisher told us to stop using those words because now it was two hundred and sixty pages. But um, the, it was interesting because we would every time we would get together, the the article would grow. We were having a hard time even keeping it to what would be an article um, because it was a very untraditional way that the book ended up growing. And it really was out of a conversation. The book is um, kind of an outward expression of our conversations over the past but, 13 but, years. But Amy Lloyd, Grace Lloyd had commissioned it for Playboy. We'd been uh, promised a fee for pr providing it. And, uh, and so it kept growing out of hand and we kept trying to contain it. Yeah. Finally, we submitted it, uh, and uh, Hugh Hefner personally rejected the uh, the article. <laughs> you, he, you, but, ex you explain why. But they um, he, they didn't reject Kip. They rejected my paintings because I hadn't uh, properly objectified the women in Playboy. They said it wasn't the, up to the Playboy standards of what they expected. Um, so I took that as a personal compliment. I still. <laughs> So he took the book and uh, the, the article and decided to turn it into a book. Now we get to where, where I was trying to jump to it in order to avoid play, play. And, and, and so uh, you got a friend to lay, lay the book out. Yeah, so at that point, uh, the article was, um, in, was not in uh, poetic prose. It was really a description of the warp side of the universe and these three to five paintings. Um, but, but when I write ordinary prose, I still try to polish it so it flows really nicely in a compelling sort of a way. And a friend of mine, we basically had a pile of paintings and then a Word document. And it was really hard to understand what that could possibly be. And so just as a favor, a friend of mine did a very basic layout. But what she did is she broke apart Kip's language into what looked almost like stanzas, right? She was taking kind of creative, um, like, free reign of breaking these words into places that she sort of felt it flowed with the, with the images. Then I look at the page that had paintings, had broken up stanza-like pieces of prose, and I stared at that and I had an epiphany. I have a really great epiphany once every two or three years. <laughs> it gives me enormous pleasure. You're, you're interviewing physicists about uh, how they get pleasure out of science. I got enormous pleasure out of this epiphany that uh, this could be poetry, it could be verse. And uh, I made a decision very quickly to try to turn this into verse. But I had never written any poetry in my life, really, to speak of, except an occasional love poem to my wife here. And uh, 
Uh, so this was hard, but with enormous enjoyment and a lot of sweat, I started converting the prose into, into verse. And so then it, the whole thing, but the book just simply grew organically as my verse in, inspired her paintings, her paintings inspired my verse. And it was really a, 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 a the whole, the growth process is like the final book in the sense that the verse and the, uh, the paintings are tightly interwoven as they were built, as it was created, and as it wound up in the end. So that's a long answer to you. Well, that's, that's a good answer. So I have a question first for Leah and then a separate question for you, Kip. So Leah, I've, I've looked at some of your other paintings on the internet and, and I see that, that you're interested in science. Um, what is it about science that interests you as a painter and artist? Well, I am deeply curious about the natural world and I've always loved taking something that I'm trying to understand or grapple with almost the experience of it. So um, I should say that this is actually a really big departure for me. I exist in the contemporary art world where I show in a gallery, show in museums. This is very different. And a lot of those projects, they take many years, maybe not 13 years, but um, uh, I engage with a concept and then I'm really eager to explore through different medium how I can almost understand that concept and bring that experience to the viewer in a gallery um, in a gallery setting. So I think fundamentally, that's just the, um, those are to me the things that I'm interested in grappling with as an artist is that kind of subject matter, is things that are historically or archivally linked to how we understand the world around us. So do you think that, that your paintings, and we can uh, specify for this particular book, do your paintings have ideas in them? In the book? Your Even, paintings there yeah. uh, that you did for the book, do you feel that they have ideas in them? Absolutely. I mean, the, pa the paintings themselves, they're carrying the conversation and the interpretation of what Kip is saying to me, but, the, I, but they also are... Um, kind of propagating their own experience of, of the imagery and the, um, and the ideas that they've been inspired by. Well, let me ask you a question, Kip. Um, you've written uh, a number of popular books as well as uh, weighty scientific treaties. Um, this book uh, is the most artistic book that you've written. Oh, by far. And, uh, do you have a, did you receive in writing this book and enjoying it now, is, is there a particular new kind of satisfaction that you feel in having written uh, and, and collaborated on, on an artistic book? Yes, I, I, I see this book, I gradually came to see this book fairly quickly, but as we went along, as conveying science, and aspects of science in a very different way than anything I'd ever done before and, and th than anything I've seen. Uh, it conveys the essence of the ideas, uh, the feeling, the experience of the ideas without going into the technical detail that I uh, do in my other writings, whether it's black holes and time warps or the science of interstellar, there's a lot of technical detail there about how big a black hole is, about how much smaller human beings are than black holes, that they're going to fall into the black hole. Here, the, it, it's not a desire at all to convey uh, full detail. It's a desire to convey the essence of fundamentally what's going on. And, I, and when I found myself doing that, I just had a feeling that it's just a very different way of communicating, and it's communicating a different aspect of this than I have before, and it's communicating an aspect that uh, I think can appeal to people who are not science nerds, like probably most of you are, uh, like I am, uh, but appeal also to people who didn't uh, know they had any interest in science, but come at it from the arts and discover here the essence of some amazing ideas that we have uh, developed and discovered we might scientists, physicists, colleagues, and I about the universe. 
Yes, well, we actually have a, a, a theater uh, here uh, in Cambridge that uh, tries to convey science through the theater. And of course, there was uh, Michael Frayn's great play, Copenhagen, and the film, The Beautiful Mind. Yes. So uh, I, I think that there are other people who, who are trying to do what you're doing and using the arts as a way to oh. convey science who, to people who wouldn't normally or otherwise be interested in, in science. Um, so I asked this question to both of you, and uh, you can take turns answering however you want to do it. Um, uh, a lot of people in the public, uh, or a lot of the public, uh, see uh, the sciences and the arts as being uh, very separate from each other. Uh, and scientists and artists as being different kinds of people. So what do you see, the two of you, that, that scientists and artists have in common? What is the common ground between scientists and artists? Where do they meet? I'm very interested in this question. I think about this a lot. I, um, I teach painting and art, but I also have developed a lot of art and science courses <clears throat> at Chapman University in Southern California. And I'm really interested in that foundational level of problem solving that both artists and scientists engage at the bottom level. And of course, there's two different trajectories where at some point that, um, you know, that path splits. But for so much of that entry level inquisition about whether it's, uh, let's take, you know, the natural world at large or some specific um, uh, subject within it, there's so much that the two can engage in in a wonderful dialogue just on the base level of problem solving. Can you give an example of problem solving? Sure. So I teach a course called The Intersection of Art and Science, and I take my students to NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab every other Friday. And in the beginning of the semester, my students are like, oh, NASA, it's so cool, this is fantastic, but I don't have anything to contribute here. But towards the end of the semester, they start seeing that these engineers, these designers, these scientists are trying to think so far out of the box because there are no rules, and how different is that really than creating a sculpture based on an idea that no one has ever um, created before. And so I think towards the end of the semester, I personally see my students have an evolution that it really is about exploring something from almost like circling around an idea or a concept or a problem that if you're, if you're thinking in a creative way, you'll you know, an engineer must take an absolutely different path than an artist, but that there is a common ground and a common language um, through the link of creativity and problem solving that they both can share in. Kip, can you speak yeah, to that? I uh, can speak to it in a very different way. Yeah. Uh, as a physicist, <clears throat> I work with the laws of physics to try to understand the universe around us. Those laws of physics are uh, written in the language of mathematics. And mathematics really underlies our understanding of the universe. But if I'm trying to figure something out mathematically by manipulating the laws of physics, it's very slow. And so I have to have some way to make intuitive leaps uh, to see what I might learn by doing a piece of mathematics, to decide what, what calculation is worth doing, uh, decide uh, uh, to speculate about uh, some, how something may be working and then I can verify it with the mathematics, or I can propose to my colleagues who make observations, go do some observations to test the ideas. But the intuitive leaps, which are the, the essence of how I function as a physicist, uh, uh, the most important, the most near and dear to my heart, uh, they are they, I carry them out through pictures in my mind. And so my mind works very geometric. They have geometrical pictures. I have visual pictures that uh, give me my intuition, that carry my intu intuition uh, about how a black hole works, about how a wormhole might work, about uh, how gravitational waves are produced. And so 
uh, when I'm collaborating with Leah as an artist, it's very easy to feed her the, the essence of the, of the science I'm doing. I just feed her the mental pictures that I'm using for my own intuition and my research. And so I, for me, uh, the art is part and parcel of the science. It's, it's the, the key to my intuition. And, and going back and forth with her is turning into a much more powerful visual form the thing, the more crude mental pictures that I had in my mind when I came to her. Well, speaking of visual pictures, um, I think probably most people in the audience uh, have heard of Stephen Hawking. And of course, with his disability, he was not able to do calculate in the same way that most physicists do. Can you say, uh, make a few comments about how Hawking used visual pictures in his work? Yeah. So. Hawking, Steve, Stephen was a dear friend of mine. I'll call him Stephen. I know he also spent some uh, considerable time here at Harvard in the, the later part of his life. Uh, Stephen, uh, when he lost the use of his lost the use of his hands, he was forced to uh, go over to a method where he was doing the science in his head, and he did it by means of visual pictures, uh, often visual pictures that involved. Uh, topological structures, geometrical structures that he manipulated in his head. And it was through those kinds of mental manipulations that he had the insight that led to what's called his second law of black hole mechanics, that uh, if two black holes collide, uh, the surface area of the final black hole will be bigger than the sum of the surface areas of the initial black holes, which turned out to, in fact, in the end, to be a classical manifestation of uh, the uh, second law of thermodynamics. And so, but the, the very deep discoveries that he made uh, through most of his career after he lost the use of his hands were made through manipulating visual pictures in his mind. So let me ask a, a related question to both of you. Um, to what extent are scientists artists and to what extent are artists scientists? Well, you'll be pleased to know that Kip made quite a, many drawings in my studio over these 13 years that maybe we should uh, bring those up on the slide. No, no, thank you. No, they were crude, crude sketches because I knew she would turn them into something really beautiful. So if you want to see my drawings, you, you go to my book, The Science of Interstellar, and there are a number of the drawings in there are hand drawings by me, well, hand with the use of some rulers and straight edges, but. Uh, uh, but uh, I did uh, a lot of the drawings myself by hand for, for that particular book. And, and I developed, the, the key to that is I have a keen sense of perspective, which is part of how I visualize things, what, part of what enables me to, feed, to do science and to feed stuff to Leah. I got that keen sense of perspective as a freshman at Caltech in 1958, I know it's before any of you were born, but uh, at that time we still had a piece of our educational program there that was dating back to the uh, previous century. We were required to take an engineering drawing course. Everybody, every freshman is required to do that. And that was one of the most useful courses I ever took because I really learned about perspective, how to draw things in three dimensions and uh, I used that as a, a key tool for myself in, throughout my career in my scientific research. And it carries over to, to uh, the science of interstellar and to my uh, work with Leo. And even that, even that kind of question of are artists scientists or scientists artists, I mean, if you back up in time, there's definitely a point where we all somehow in our childhood decided we're artists, we're creative enough to be um, you know, to, to make anything we want, or we're scientists, we're curious about why mud is wet or why the sky is blue, and then there's sort of a cutoff maybe in our lives. But if you back up to what Kip is saying, I mean, being able to, for a scientist to create an embodiment of whatever they're looking at would be so useful, not only for 
I would imagine for them, but for communicating that to others and getting others excited about what they're doing. So, um, you know, my question is like, are those, <laughs> we need those categories, right, for saying this is where I'm going in my vocation. But I do think that there's not enough credit given that artists and scientists have so much in common because of the way they fundamentally think about tangibly understanding what they're studying. I mean, even as an artist and probably many, many artists go through such a profound under, like dedication to technically executing something that's very similar to Kip as a theoretical physicist having to pair with a um, experiment like LIGO um, you know, the scales are so off, right? I'm talking about technical proficiency in my studio for making, say, an insulation video or a painting. It's very different than LIGO. But that understanding of concept and then technical um, marriage is really important for both. Leah, do you feel that when you're working on uh, a painting or a concept, do you ever pose that process in terms of a question with an answer? Because you, you mentioned problem solving. Yeah. So do you, do you think that there are uh, answers to the questions that artists ask? I, th I wouldn't say I come up with an answer, but I come up with um, a project that to me is the um, invitation to others to ask it. So um, it's, it's hard to kind of explain these things without you know, showing them, but I, in the recent years, have made a um, installation video. It's called Double Horizon. You can find it online, or like little excerpts of it. And I propose this question, how could I represent the idea of landscape w with time? Like, how could you represent time? And I'd never made a video before, but I thought, oh, if I'm making a piece about time, I have to use a time-based medium and I was learning how to fly a plane. So I like attached all these cameras, the external parts of a plane. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing, but it was like so delightful to be, you know, to just try to come up with something that would surprise and excite me that could possibly delight and surprise the viewer to maybe think about landscape and time in a totally different way. So it was through what this, just like you said, the concept then drove me to make this project. Well, I know that in, in literature that, uh, that if a reader fully understands a character, the character is dead. Yes, yeah. That there, there are levels of, of depth that even the, the writer doesn't fully yeah. grasp. So there are uh, questions without answers, you might put it in that yeah. way, that are... are a very powerful part of that particular art. So I'll ask Kip, do you think that scientists are always working on problems that have definite answers? <laughs> we often work on problems that we don't know whether there's a definite answer or not. We, uh, sometimes we hope there's a definite answer. Sometimes we ho hope it'll turn out there's not a definite answer. Uh, because it may lead us in some new direction, new surprising direction. Um, the, uh, some of the most interesting science is a sort of a fishing expedition, just to see what's out there, not looking for a definite answer, but just to, just to explore. Um, uh, and then there also is, as we have learned in more modern mathematics, there are certain propositions in mathematics and that probably carry over also to science that are undecidable. And, right. uh, the, and uh, so, so no, I mean, there's a, there's a richness of kinds of outcome of research. Yeah. And uh, you, uh, when going in, when trying to go very deep in, into some issue, you, may not know what kind of outcome it's going to be. It's, it may not be a definite answer. It may be something else. Well, I know that um, uh, a graduate student in physics who's getting a, a, working on a thesis, they would not be very happy giving a project that's a fishing expedition. <laughs> <laughs> But see, this is very similar to artists. I mean, you, you have to be in the realm of, like, you don't know if you're starting a new project, if there's going to be a payoff, 
you know, yeah. and I think like you were saying about a character dead in the water, I, I mean, as an artist, I would say it would be what a dull career to make the same work over and over and over mm -hmm. again. So there's a huge amount of my artistic practice where I'm sort of in the unknown or doing something that maybe feels like pretty embarrassing or kind of weird because I just don't know if it's going to turn into something. Well, um, picking up on, on Kip's statement that, that sometimes we don't know the answer or where the answer is, you worked on the LIGO project, the laser interferometry gravitational, gravitational interferometer that detected gravitational waves in 2015, which you read about a little bit here. Um, you worked on that project for over 40 years. Did you know for all of those years that you were definitely going to be able to detect gravitational waves? No, of course not. <laughs> However, at the very beginning, um, when I was exploring whether to get into this field seriously and whether to uh, bring my students into it, uh, the question I asked myself is, uh, well, it was clear to me that the payoff, if we succeeded, was enormous. That uh, we would be doing for gravitational waves what Galileo did for electromagnetic waves, creating instruments whereby we could explore the universe with the only, only other kind of wave that exists that can travel across the universe, bringing us information about what's far, far away. So the payoff would be enormous. Uh, and so uh, what were the odds of success? Were they high enough that I should, uh, uh, with my students, devote a considerable portion of my career and, and theirs uh, to helping Ray Weiss and the experimenters pull it off? And it took me three years to convince myself that uh, the uh, odds were high enough. And high enough for me was, uh, well, I wasn't giving precise odds, but it was uh, better than 50-50 odds, basically, that we, that we could pull it off at the beginning. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, by the time we actually started asking for the big bucks, which turned out to be a billion dollars uh, in 1989, uh, I was at the point where I, my own private odds were getting up around 80% or, or so. But uh, it was never 100% by any means. It was an issue, there were two issues. Uh, how kind would nature be with the strength of the waves and how good were the experimenters and could they uh, really pull it off? And, uh, and those, uh, I did know how good the experimenters were. It was an absolutely superb team, but I, we didn't know how kind nature was going to be until <laughs> we saw the waves. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, uh, and I know this speaking as a physicist myself, that, that you knew that the gravitational waves existed. Yes, yes. So the real problem, it seems to me, uh, or one of the real problems was, uh, and you alluded to it, was would the technology of detection improve over 40 years? And of yes. course, when you started off, it wasn't nearly sensitive enough. It yes. wasn't good enough. But... Uh, a number of new technologies were have, had to be created to get from where you were 45 years ago to 2015. Were you pretty sure that, uh, that human beings would be able to create the needed technology? Uh, if the waves were at the level where I thought they were, and my guesses were pretty good, then I was pretty sure human beings could do it. Yeah. Um, if they were, uh, the waves were weaker by a factor of 10 in amplitude, which means you had to search a volume of the universe that was a, a thousand times bigger, I still believed we could do it because I, we had to invent new technology for that, which has been done and is now operating in LIGO. Uh, I knew we could get to there, but if it had been more like a factor of 30, I, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have known. But nature, but, but, uh, I was, we were quite sure, sure by that time, maybe the 90% level that it was, was within that factor of 10. Well, um, LIGO is arguably the most sensitive scientific instrument that's ever been built. And could you tell our audience here, describe 
the sensitivity of how far apart the mirrors are and how far a displacement you can measure. Let me just say that in this book, uh, I do describe fairly briefly yes. the history of LIGO and the emotional feelings that I had when Ray Weiss first proposed this to me and I thought he was crazy and then coming around to uh, uh, realizing that maybe it was possible, but the, the, the difficulty and the, emo the, 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 the experience of going through it all. Uh, but how small was it? Well, uh, one way to say it is that the, uh, you're looking, measuring gravitational waves by, as we say in the verse in, in, that I read, uh, uh, the gravitational waves stretch, stretch and squeeze a beam of bouncing light. The light is bouncing back and forth between mirrors. And each mirror is made of atoms. And the, when the gravitational wave comes along, it pushes the mirrors back and forth. And so the light beam is squeezed. And uh, that's how, how the thing works. Uh, the motion of the mirrors is 10 million times less than the size of one of the atoms in the face of the mirror off which the light is bouncing. So the wish was, issue was, can you design an instrument where you can measure the motion of a mirror by bouncing light off of it when the motion of the mirror is 10 million times smaller than the individual atoms in the face of the mirror? So the mirrors are, are a couple of miles apart yeah. or so, and you're measuring their motion a distance less than 10 millionths of an atom's Adam. width. That's right. And that's when I saw that, I already had some sense of how strong these waves would be when in 1972 when Ray proposed this. When I saw that, I, as I say, I thought he'd gone crazy. And the, the verse is in there describing how crazy I thought Ray had gone. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then over a period of uh, about three years, I. It was right when you were my student. It was right when you were at Caltech. Uh, yeah. But I was, you, you were working on other things. I, I wasn't trying to, to feed my no. students this. We, yes. But, 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 uh, but over that period of three years, I spent a lot of time talking to Ray and to Vladimir Braginsky in Moscow and other experimenters. I educated myself as best I could about the techniques and the, the ultimate limitations and uh, convinced myself that we had a real shot at success, which we did in the end. Well, it's an extraordinary uh, experiment, an extraordinary yeah. accomplishment. Um, I think we have uh, just a, a few minutes for questions now. And, uh, okay, yeah. One up there. Um, this is a question mainly for Professor um, Thorne. So Sorry, you mentioned my name is Kip. I don't <laughs> rat answer to Professor Thorne. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you mentioned obviously your involvement uh, in LIGO and the search for gravitational waves. Um, do you have much involvement in the search for the, I don't know, ever elusive holy grail that is the graviton? Um, and if not, or if so, would you care to comment a bit on? maybe the feasibility of its search and of its theorization? Uh, so the gravitational waves that we look for are carried by a humongously large number of gravitons. And when you have a humongously large number of them all doing the same thing together, it behaves as a very classical wave. And we don't have the technology to dig down in that wave and see the fluctuations, the teeny, teeny fluctuations associated with individual gravitons. Uh, on the other hand, the gravitational waves leave an imprint on the classical waves that we measure. And from that imprint, we can infer properties of the graviton, such as that its so-called rest mass is zero, which means because it propagates at the speed of light, uh, or that it has, quote, spin two, unquote. So we just, we get the information indirectly. Somebody way up in the back. Uh, 
Hello. <laughs> well, we had a physics question, so I now have um, an art question. Uh, I know that you work in multiple mediums, but your book is all um, paintings. What do you think is the best medium for depicting, uh, as you call it, the warp side of the universe? <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's been the most exciting thing for me in my studio is to let the subject matter dictate what the medium is. So for the collaboration with Kip, it was really important that I was able to make things that were very quick. So a lot of the paintings are very small. There's no painting that's actually physically larger than about, I would say almost like 17 by 22 inches. And in the book, you'll find 100 final paintings. But over 13 years, I made over 660 paintings to get to the final 100. And so, um, you know, if you're asking that question, like I'm making an exhibition of paintings, I might say oil painting because I'm going to take two years to make 10 paintings. But for this book, or it might be that sound might be the best way to depict the warp side of our universe because we're not looking at visual astronomy, right, with the invention that LIGO has given us. Um, but for this book, it was really important that I could work very quickly and iterate back and forth to Kip. So one of the best parts of this collaboration was um, making a painting, have Kip over at my studio and him sort of pointing at one part and saying it needs to twist this way or kind of drawing on it and going back and forth and back and forth. So many of the final paintings have between, I would say a minimum of three to upwards of 12 paintings just to get to that final version. So in this case, I loved that they're all ink on, uh, on film. So the paintings are very, very fluid and they're made uh, very quickly, but there's a lot of other paintings that needed to be made to get to that final piece. Let me push you a little bit on this, uh, Leah. Uh, you began by saying that uh, the the subject matter helps dictate the uh, medium. Uh, well, your subject matter uh, for uh, the art that is at CFA, uh, which is astronomical involving uh, women in astronomy in uh, the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century, uh, you chose a medium which re relied on the sun, yeah. uh, an astrophysical object, in, in order to uh, make the paintings. For this, uh, warp side of the universe involves gravity, and so you uh, ha chose a medium where gravity comes into play. So can you exp explain that? <laughs> see, see, I'm better at knowing how she ought to answer her We're going to start doing me. each other's <laughs> answers. So if anyone has any questions about how LIGO works, you'll get an interesting answer from me. It might not be the right one, but um, yeah, And I probably explain. gave you a wrong answer. But anyway, take, take off from what yeah. I said. Um, I, I think that's a great example of the 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 series that was in the introduction about that's called your body is a space that sees part of the uh, aspect of the um that i love so much is that when i was doing the research here at harvard um one of the weirdest and maybe inflammatory bits of information i found out was that the women at the turn of the century were not allowed to ever look through the telescope i think they thought that women would like dissolve if they were out at night <laughs> It's cold outside. I mean, it's pretty cold outside. We're from California. It's like really extreme out there for us right now. But, um, but I just thought how bizarre all these women are doing this extremely important work, but they're only looking at glass photographic plates. And so I loved the idea that through looking, the experience of the universe was actually came to life within their bodies. That's the allusion to the, the title, your body is a space that sees, and that I would actually need astronomy to make the series. So all the pieces are done in these large scale cyanotypes um, and I make them in Los Angeles, but I can actually only make them between June and mid August because of the way that the sun per moves across the sky. And I love that it's like actually uh, determined by where the earth is in relation to the sun. I mean, it's, it's so annoying and very hard to work that way, but um, it's built into the project. And that but is- But it relies on solar ultraviolet light to, yeah. 
to make these cyanotypes. Yeah. I mean, at first experimenting, my studio team and I like built these big um, like solar beds to try to, um, to mimic, and it turns out the sun is really powerful. Do you guys know this? <laughs> yeah, like... and then gravity and uh, the medium for these paintings. Yeah, so uh, in a lot of the pieces, you know, you can see that they're very, very fluid, and um, the ink doesn't sink into the paper, kind of uh, moves around until the uh, water evaporates. She puts the, she puts the ink in. on paper that will not absorb any of the ink. It, it just sits there as a pool. I think we should bring up one of my regular slide presentations and let's see how good you can get through explaining <laughs> the rest of my work because you're doing he's doing oh, a great job. Mark, I'll quiet down. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah, so I, but what he's trying to get me to say is that the, um, I, I'm guessing here, is that the, um, the ink itself actually was a little bit out of control in the pieces. And so we, I might have a piece that I thought was looking really good and then I come back an hour later and it, 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 it doesn't capture what Kip and I were going for, which is like the experience of the universe. So, and even in the, um, which I hope you'll, we're gonna sign books after this and I hope you'll uh, take, a, take some time and really sit with the book, but um, there's parts where there's a dark blue background and, and white text over, over it. And in those pieces, every single page is its own painting. So there's you, you know basically 260 unique pages in the book. Um, and in that case, the ink itself sort of tells you a little bit about the universe. On one hand, you look at it, you can tell that it's like a close up of something, but it also has a, a topographical feel that suggests a really, really large scale. Is it, um, like similar to what you see from the Mars Surveyor looking at a surface of a planet. Is it something really close? I think the viewer has the, the material sort of has the option to invite the viewer to different experiences of scale through the medium itself. So I guess the mysterious voice over here. Um, the conversations uh, can keep on going. We, as uh, Leah said, we're continuing um, the evening for the next hour. We'll be over at the Cabot Library, which is just across the way here. If you see the eggs and the, uh, the little stall styles, whatever, the walkthrough gate things, uh, that's where we will be. Uh, we'll both have uh, more books for uh you to purchase and take home with you tonight. The other thing is that Leah actually has created a limited edition print related to the book launch itself. So that uh, if you catch a QR code at the table, you can order that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming out. And if you're interested in more of these conversations, feel free to sign up for the uh, CFA newsletter and the Harvard Plate Stacks newsletter. But thank you all so much. One more round of applause.